Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 433. I'm Gavin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 7th of September, 2018. What, there's no special day? You can't think of a saint we're honoring today? What's going on again? No. Um, <laughs> when I... When I looked this morning, um, the, 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 I couldn't find the saint that I was very interested in. I have to say, Kevin, I'm a bit, I'm a bit personalist over this. Um, occasionally, the Church of England gives me people to remember that I'm not very impressed by, I, and I, I pass them over. <laughs> so I am a bit idiosyncratic about my saints. Okay, as you can tell, Gavin and I are going to have a lot of fun. Hopefully, you'll have some fun watching us today. We're going to talk a little bit about, uh, oh boy, economy, politics, parables, and uh, how they all fit together. You and I started recording um, fr more frequently right around Brexit. And I remember when uh, you guys voted to leave the European Union, you and I talked frequently about it and how this was such a... A change to the the norm in Britain. You know, normally the 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 modern day Brit is go along, get along, and if we can, you know, make ourselves happier in a big organizations like the European Union, we'll just do it. And um, I got to say, watching you guys Brexit makes me think that that's still true. It's very hard for you guys to change. It's very hard to do that. But I think part of the problem is the European Union making it harder for you. Um, let's give people a, a quick Brexit update because I know there's news this week. Well, we're we're really playing a, a game of bluff mm -hmm. with each other. Um, the uh, the British government is is trying. Well, the problem is the British government is divided into factions already, so you don't really know uh, which faction is in charge and what they really stand for. The European Union is very keen to punish us so badly to stop anybody else even thinking of doing the whole thing because the euro is in great danger of unraveling the whole project is is in is in serious danger with greece defaulting having broken all the economic rules the eu said it was going to impose uh, the uh, italian con economy is in is in a very dangerous state at the moment um, when we come to 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 Welby and his um, economic plan for salvation for England, one of the things people have been saying is that the amount of public indebtedness in British Isles is just enormous, both oh, public absolutely. and and private. Mm -hmm. So the whole of the European and indeed the West, well, let's let's leave out America, but but certainly the European economy, in and outside the European Union, is very fragile indeed. Now it's my belief because I. I uh, I'm, I'm a Brexiteer on the basis that uh, I think my politicians should be accountable. Though I'm a Europhile because I speak three European languages and love Europe. And, what I don't and you like. own a castle in France, as we tease you about. Well, <laughs> <laughs> don't even the, the complications of Brexit will the, the, and the raised taxes there will. Uh, the thing I don't, don't even want to go to. Sure. But anyway, um, but the, so what's been happening is we've been waiting to see who's going to blink first, and it looks as though there's some possibility that at last the Europeans might blink. They've been trying to frighten us out of a hard Brexit. A hard Brexit essentially means that we go free, completely free. Uh, a soft Brexit is one where we are, we, we get no privileges, but we still pay a lot to, to kind of belong and are somewhat controlled. Interestingly enough, I was listening to a podcast today where uh, they were talking about um, the way you can't believe politicians. And, and I, I heard something I hadn't heard before, which was the reason why the Conservative government introduced gay marriage was not because they wanted to be cool and, and hip and with it and get the young vote, though they probably did want those things, but because the Europe, one of the European courts had passed legislation uh, bringing into to, to European jurisprudence the notion that gay marriage was a human right. It said, astonishingly, gay marriage is a human right now, uh, and marriage to animals might become one. Um, I have to say, I don't know if that was a sardonic joke by the commentator or if that's really true. But sardonic joke or not, it was it was imposed by uh, the European community, which, again, is as part of its project. And so there was no way in which we were able to have a public debate about it or hold elected politicians to account. So um, there's just the possibility at the moment that the European Union conceive we might have the courage and the will to break with no deal, in which case we then have to find our way 
in trading with under WTO rules, which are there. And there's, there's no doubt it, it will probably cause some difficulty and some hiccups. But it, it's a bit like the children of Israel and Egypt. You can go free, but there'll be a pr there'll be some inconvenience. Or you don't go, or you don't desert. go free, <laughs> and there's the desert, or you don't go free, and it'll be very convenient. Yeah. So to some extent, this is a test of, of, our, of our character and our resolve. Do we want do we want freedom? The trouble is, so many people in the last twenty or thirty years have been brought up in a state coddled culture. And they're not sure if they want their freedom. Now, that's here, true here in America, too. We've watched over the last 60 years um, very progressive judges change laws that the uh, um, people who elected these peop uh, politicians didn't want changed. We have a constitution, and people understand the constitution. But slowly over time, the liberals have got their judges in place and have changed some mighty big laws uh, or influenced them in a different interpretation. And this is something that a whole generation has grown up with. There's a whole generation in America who's never known a non-abortive America. Uh, a whole, you know, it, it's amazing. And so when you try to talk to the millennial generation about some truth and realities they fight you tooth and nail because they don't want the change this is just what they've understood it's always been this way uh, why would you want to change change could hurt and we see that so many times in your brexit fight it's very interesting in the way in which the commentators talk about um uh, the agenda of the left intending to replace nuclear Christian marriage of men and women and children mm -hmm. with a whole variety of things, uh, including gay marriage. But behind all this is the intention that the state becomes the new parent. This was Marxism 1.0, and many of us think sure. it's cultural Marxism 2.0. Mm -hmm. This idea of the state being the parent, of course, involves... The, uh, the diminishment of people taking responsibility and i wish we could move from beyond the political left and right uh language which emerged from the french court after the french revolution those who sat on the left and mm -hmm. the right of the king very good because you because um, well, what we're really talking about is is big state and little state mm -hmm. big state where the state takes most responsibility uh, and 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 small state where people take more responsibility and so um i hate being described as right wing uh or or, or extreme right is a, anyone not left of center is now extreme right or you have outright um but what we really are is 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 diminished state no gavin you have a new title you are a commentator on fake news did you know that <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah, that was so incredibly insulting do you know the the man is a liar i'm sorry to say this but he's lying yes and he must know that he's lying and so to tell lies about other christians in public is a very serious sin one of the things that you and i and george do is we're very careful about our fact now our opinions are another matter yes people can say what they like about our opinions uh, and and you know we live and die by them some people like them some people to modify them some people hate them all well and good yes. but the facts are are, are uh, we're very careful about them and to be described as a purveyor of fake news is a is a serious piece of spiritual and moral nastiness mm. Uh, no, agreed. So let's talk a little bit about you belong to, well, you used to belong to, the Church of England is a state church. And so if the state grows or shrinks, that affects the state. And I saw, I didn't read the paper, but I saw some comments from Justin Willoughby about what he thinks the shape, the, the, shape, the state should be doing uh, by raising taxes to hand out to people. Now, I'm going to give this as my capitalist American opinion. I live in a state that takes my taxes. I live in a state that always has the best of intentions. In the uh, late 90s, and uh, mid 90s, and uh, late 80s, they said, we're going to have casinos. Don't worry about the casinos. All that money is just going to go to education. It won't go to anything else. We promise never to touch it except for education. That promise lasted three years. After three years, the casino money started to fund little projects here, little state projects there. Oh, all of a sudden, we don't have enough money for the next road project, so the casino money goes to the road projects. The most untrustable uh, entity with your money, uh, other than your spouse probably, is the state. 
<laughs> and, uh, you better so, take that back. <laughs> <laughs> we are recording in front of a live studio audience today. <laughs> and so I wish that is my capitalist American uh, perspective on this. I do not trust the state with my money. Um, and to see Justin Welby, and I'll, I'll have you describe to the audience what he's suggesting, um, to me is the greatest failure and the last breath of the Church of England. So what, what does Welby want to do? Welby has joined a group called the Institute of Public Policy Research. It's a think tank. It's progressive. It's left wing. And they have they, they have looked, they say they're looking at society and society is in a mess. Well, it's true. Society is in a mess. Um, I think I remember, I, I can't find the link, but um, uh, Billy Graham's wife at some time put out a, a lovely commentary on the Ten Commandments, saying here are the Ten Commandments and here's what Americans, here's how American society has rejected each one of them mm -hmm. and you wonder why we're in a mess. So um, as we get further and further away from a, a Christian society, um, the, the, the natural mess and disorder of turning our backs on God will get worse. Instead of diagnosing this as sin uh, and inviting society to, to turn back to God in repentance, Justin Welby has instead become a socialist, um, or rather he's taken the socialist remedy. So the Institute of Public Policy Research has said, society is in trouble, there are lots of poor people, lots of people who can't f feed themselves, which is all um, tragically true. Mm -hmm. And it is therefore the, the responsibility of the state to raise taxes to feed them. Now, uh, and at the end of, of uh, his press release, he quotes the second half of Matthew 25, the story of the sheep and the goats, saying, uh, your, your salvation depends upon you putting my project into action. There, there are whoa, a number whoa, of problems whoa. here. So the state can earn salvation by doing good works with their money. That's exactly right. If you if you let the state this raise taxes, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> and ignore the leaf blower is, outside because that's just Fridays around here. <laughs> this is a new form of indulgence the theology. <laughs> if you pay if you pay money, you either get time of purgatory or you go to heaven. Um, of course, this is this is poor theology in a number of ways. Let's leave aside um, whether Jesus was talking about. Uh, the community around the church or, or, or everybody um, but it's quite clear that, that the, the responsibility at judgment when our Lord brings everyone in front of him is an individual responsibility have you personally visited the sick when I was a, a parish priest I remember preaching on Matthew 25 I went through the list before my sermon and as I did I, I kind of did a checklist Lord am I doing this when did I last clothe somebody when did I last and, and I, I got to the prison bit and I said, you know, Lord, I, I, I haven't I haven't been to prison. I'm, I'm really sorry. So the next day I phoned the prison on, on Jersey up and to cut a long story short, it took about six months. But I got myself into prison and found myself leading a Bible study group. Now, I don't say this in a in a any real, in, in a self-pleasing way. What I'm saying is that this checklist applies to each one of us so that on the last day we can say to the Lord when he says, have you done these things? We can say yes or no. I don't think, as you were saying, there's any mandate for saying, well, Lord, uh, I let the state do it for me. Uh, I, I decided to adopt a left-leaning socialist fiscal program, and the state then spent my money on my behalf, and so so we'd both like credit for that. Uh, Apart well, from anything else, go on. If I'm to interpret what Justin is saying here, is that when Jesus was walking uh, through the towns and uh, having uh, meetings with the tax collectors and the prostitutes, he was asking advice. How do I raise money for my church? How do I get the state to participate <laughs> in the church, Zacchaeus? How do we how do we do this? Can I can you help me out here? And you know, clearly that's not what happened. But uh, I don't think that I was, I, I was engaged in a Twitter a Twitter <laughs> spat with one of the suffragan bishops of London, and I was saying, look, you know, this is socialism. It's not Christianity. Okay. Uh, read Augustine, St. Paul, and St. John. And he was, saying, he was saying, well, Augustine was very dualist. And I said, well, Jesus is dualist. It's it's the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of earth. Anyway, the, the, even if, let us set aside theology for the moment, though it's a, 
it, it seems to me to be theologically obvious what you we've said. To, yeah, this is obvious. There is, there is even econo uh, economics is against adjusting well-being. There is something called the Laffer curve, mm -hmm. and the Laffer curve states that there is a point beyond which, if you raise taxes, you'd get a diminished income for the state. Now, every everybody knows this. In well, everyone ought to know it. Uh, um, the, as soon as you put up corporation tax beyond a certain point companies go somewhere else as soon as you put up i, I think the, the the richest five percent pay something like forty percent of all the taxes they and have the clever reactor, accountants sure. yeah they have clever accountants who will find them other ways of reducing their tax burden in a way the poor can't but you end up by getting less money when you raise taxes so for the archbishop to say to, to, to display this economic ignorance and to say all we need to do is to put up taxes and our consciences will be clean in front of Jesus on the final day of judgment is economically and theologically uh, entirely spurious. The real problem though, this is a lack of confidence in the gospel. The gospel is about changing people's hearts, not, not giving the state advice on how to run its economic affairs. Uh, I, you know, I, I could sit here and preach capitalism all day long. Uh, sadly, the, well, not sadly, Graciously, a large portion of our audience is not American. Uh, we are an international show, so I, I'm not going to sit here. But uh, it's been said many, many times, more people have been brought out of poverty under capitalism than any other economic system in the history of mankind. Communism doesn't do it. Socialism doesn't do it. And I agree, socialism is perfect on paper. But the human heart doesn't work within socialism. The human heart doesn't work within ca uh, communism. Uh, it works within, and I'm going to use this, the parable of the talents. You take what God has given and you grow it. Not like, you know, you know, a stock fund. But you know what I get. <laughs> you know. I, I, was, I was very moved by the, the, the um, Pete Broadbent, the Bishop of Wisdom, was, mm -hmm. was ticking me off on Twitter saying, um, arguing about dualism with St. Augustine. He did say one thing I thought was very important. He said, if you don't do this, you won't notice the poor. And that did strike me because um, I live in a very rural part of the country and I don't see the poor as I used to when I was in urban centres. But uh, I, I think uh, I think one of the things we have to be aware of is that we do need to see the poor. But But that can be done through the eyes of parishes that serve the poor. And so I think for Christians whose individual consciences are touched by this perfectly proper challenge by Pete Broadbent, we need to say, well, I'm going to give some of my money to Christian communities who minister amongst the poor. And then I, I, I'd be very happy to give my money to, to a parish priest and a parish to say, please use this for the poor, much happier than I would be to give it to a government on the basis of a left-leaning think tank giving bad economic advice by the Archbishop of Canterbury who's lost his spiritual way. Let's back up 50 years, 75 years, 100, 150 years. You're in England, we can back up 500 years. It didn't <laughs> used to be the state that helped the people. It didn't. It was the church. It was the church. I was born in St. Luke's uh, Lutheran Hospital in Minneapolis, St. Paul. It was a Christian hospital. It wasn't run by the state. It wasn't run by a profit organization. Well, it probably is now. Um, but it was a, a ministry of the church. And for so long, for 2,000 years, the church did these ministries and nobody complained because it was usually very inexpensive and very good care. Uh, we've now allowed the state to become our nanny uh, and our state to take over. And they've replaced the church. And now the church... Uh, I through Justin Welby, is demanding that the state raise taxes to help the poor some more. And I think we need to give credit to bits of the church which have looked at your analysis and decided Kevin is right and caught up. So there are a number of churches which run food banks. Mm -hmm. I think this is enormously important and very helpful. I think food and clothing banks and perhaps uh, energy coupons so people can keep warm. This is a, this is a, a golden opportunity for parishes in the inner city who can find the funding to help the poor in a real way where it really matters uh, and and to, uh, many have done that over the last 20 years and frankly should be congratulated and what would be wonderful to see the archbishop of canterbury launching an appeal for the church to take 
further responsibility in areas where there are poor rather than delegating it to the state on a very poor reading of Matthew 25. A poor reading and just the bureaucracy and the money that gets lost in the state. Uh, I'm sure some money gets lost in the church, but it's a, just a portion of what gets lost in the state. Here, they did a study in Wisconsin, my home state, for every dollar given to the poor through the state, only 10 cents made it uh, through the red tape. You know, 90% got caught up in the administration, delegation, banking, unions, and all that. And, you know, when all was said and done, uh, 10 cents of every dollar was reaching the poor. Uh, the church can do better. It in, can. In, in and it often does. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, boy, indulgences. That's a big line for... <laughs> church of England. So what else is going on in England? We've hit Brexit. We've hit uh, the Church of England. Did well, we the other day, there was, a, there was a, an interesting announcement um, for the, the post of Director of Ministry. Now, the, the Director of Ministry in the Church House is one of these national jobs, mm -hmm. um, which brings with it a certain amount of prestige and a certain amount of, 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 of power and responsibility for directing the policy in the Church of England. Uh, and there is a, a woman priest called Dr. Mandy Ford. Uh, I don't know Mandy. Um, I, I want to congratulate her because uh, I think she's done something really quite splendid. She started off as a primary school teacher uh, and, and has made her way up to getting a, a PhD in the work of Paul Ricoeur, a postmodernist intellectual. Um, and uh, she did five years as a curate and has then held bureaucratic jobs in dioceses. Uh, and been running, been director of ministry in the notorious Diocese of Southwark. But the other day she landed this plum job uh, for the Church of England. The problem is uh, that, that she's, an, she's a, a self-professed lesbian in the civil partnership and is often to be seen on gay pride marches carrying rainbow banners uh, advocating uh, a change in social and spiritual ethics. Well, on wasn't there now, any openings for cathedral deans? <laughs> I don't know why she didn't get one of those jobs. Um, I, I've no doubt she'll become uh, Dean of York or something quite similar soon, yeah. um, given the people who are, are, are promoting. Um, the, the, the reason this matters is not because uh, we know enough about her to, to criticize her. She's our sister in Christ, and I'm, and, and God, God bless her. But the problem is that um, it, it, it is yet one more step in this process that we have been uh, calling out, which is to say that on the one hand, Justin Welby is saying to the whole church, um, stay with us, don't leave us, continue to give us your money, trust us, we're not going to change the laws on Christian marriage. But at the same time, the Church of England has an organization uh, under Welby's uh, oversight, uh, and quite clearly with his support, continues to appoint to positions of senior responsibility uh, lesbians uh, and and gay men in civil partnership, who are oh, I thought who are they were celibate, but just living together. Uh, who are open? Um, we don't. We we decline to to ask questions about how they express their affection for one another because it's not our business. Um, but but of course this is a this is a smokescreen. What we're really doing is moving from um, the Judeo Christian ethic to a uh, secular ethic that, that is in fact, in Christian and spiritual terms, become abominable. Um, so uh, this, this is part of the whole change of culture for the Church of England, which, which we, we simply observe it happening and say this is, um, to those Orthodox Christians who want to hold biblical and traditional standards, don't believe the leaders in the Church of England when they tell you that they are keeping things as they always were. No, the Church of England has changed a lot. It now begs the state to raise money for the poor, and it's filled its uh, deaneries with uh, those who have um, some serious uh, sexual issues. Yeah. I mean, well, and who, and who are campaigning to change the Christian law on marriage. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, Gavin, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, once again, even though it's first on the list, I forgot to do it. <laughs> uh, which is sad. We should tell people to like the episodes before they watch the episode. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you're on YouTube, or wherever you're seeing this, click the like button. Um, it helps us with the search results in Yahoo and Google and the other places. Um, share this episode. 
Um, we prefer you share it before you watch it because we don't want you to change your mind halfway through. <laughs> Obviously, we talk about lots of different topics. We talked about four topics today. If you want to comment, the best place to comment is on the YouTube channel. Just click on the video and click in the comment section and add your thoughts on what we're talking about. If we made a mistake, that's the place to put it right there. If you have not subscribed to us on YouTube, go to YouTube. You're going to see a red button that says subscribe. Click on it. It'll be fun. If you are really po really modern and you just don't watch YouTube and you don't go to Facebook or any other place, but you do podcasts, we do podcasts too. Go to Facebook. In the link section, in the show notes, you will find a link to our podcast. Click on that and you can subscribe to the podcast. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden and you've been listening to episode 433 of Anglican Unscripted. God bless you. Thank you.